Hi, this is Catherine. This is Taking Tea with Catherine. And this is Jane's Garden, which is a flavored uh, green tea by Harney and Sons. And this is in a Mr. Darcy as a cat mug, which I love. I thought that was pretty um, apt for this month. And I'm doing a mid-month wrap-up of Jane Austen July because I have a number of books I could talk about and some adaptations. And if I have time, maybe I'll talk about what I'm also currently reading. We'll see. Um, but it's been fun so far. I haven't been, I don't think, quite as accomplished in finishing things as I would have liked to have done. And I haven't made as many videos as I would have liked to have done due to circumstances, but we don't need to whine on this uh, video today. Um, so I'll talk about the good things, the, the books that I've read. And so far, pretty much everything I've read has been enjoyable, um, some more than others. Uh, I will, of course, talk about the actual book by Jane Austen, and that is Pride and Prejudice. This is, I don't know how many times I've read Pride and Prejudice. I've actually lost count. Uh, this could be a fifth, sixth time. I don't know. That's not even as much as some real, you know, you know, it's really, uh, but we're not in competition here. So I, as always, enjoyed it. This time I took it really slow because, oh, and I take it really nasal. Lovely. Very attractive. Um, because I'm doing the annotated Pride and Prejudice. Well, I did the annotated Pride and Prejudice, which I got from the library. I, um, I'm thinking about maybe doing that once a year is picking out, because I think they have an annotated every single one of Jade Austen's novels. So I'm thinking about one book every July-ish, probably July, because Jane Austen July, will focus on an annotated version of one of the books. And then if I read anything else by Jane Austen, I'll just read it straight through because it does take time, but it is interesting to get little insights. Well, for the most part, it's okay. They're describing modes of transportation and expressions that mean something a little bit differently now, or when this character says this, <clears throat> it really shows what kind of person they are. Like what Lydia uses certain types of vocabulary that really is not, not just predicting how she'll be, but also just tells you everything about her. So these are some things that I knew already, of course, but I think this is really um, helpful to get just a further nerdy goodness <laughs> into reading Pride and Prejudice. But I don't, I don't recommend it if you're going to try to read a lot of Jane Austen's novels in July um, to do all annotated because it does slow one down. Uh, but it is, it is kind of like, it, it's almost like a mindful reading of, of Pride and Prejudice. So... I probably could use a little more of that, right? Anyway, and I read one book based on a Jane Austen novel itself, and that is the Book of Emma. I would say the Book of Emma, like it's some kind of religious text. Um, but uh, this is Jane Fairfax by Joan Aiken, uh, who apparently had passed away a while ago, and I didn't realize this book how old it was when I first got it out of the library. It was like, I think it was written in the very early nineties. So I'm, I'm actually glad about that because it, it's, it wasn't, I'm not going to say anything that's been written recently. Some of it's been really good. So I'm not saying it's bandwagony, but it's definitely not in the early nineties because it wasn't, I'm not saying it wasn't done, but I think maybe not as much. And, uh, I really do think that people have been Jane Austen fanatics, enjoyers, whatever you want to call it for a very long time. Uh, and including, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. But there was something about the 1990s and Jane Austen that, I don't know, just clicked for a lot of people. I don't, I, I sound selfish when I'm saying that because I started reading Jane Austen in the 90s. So I'm like, is it all about me? It's not though. I see that with a lot of things. I see a lot of people even um, when they're talking about getting into Jane Austen, somehow the 90s really ramped it up. There were some great adaptations that were done even in the 80s, but I don't know what it was. Anyway, I'm not going to harp too much on my uh, memory lane today, although I am kind of dressed very 20 years ago today. Um, the 90s were longer than that. Anyway, Jane Fairfax. I'm glad this book was written because Jane comes into the story and is... Um, I don't know, a breath of fresh air, but she is a, a different character. You hear about her the whole novel, and if you're if you're 
firmly on Emma's side, you, you feel that Jada Fairfax is a bit of a nuisance. She comes in and everybody likes her and talks about her and she's getting a lot of attention that is taking away from Emma. So that's true, but then you realize her story a little bit in the book, in Jane Austen's book, and you realize that she has a bit of a rough time of it. She doesn't have the privileges that Emma has of just being able to live a life of ease, I guess you would say, and wealth. She actually has to face a world where she might have to work. And then of course, I don't want to give total spoilers away if you don't, if you haven't read Emma, but sometimes when in July, it's really hard to talk about these books without talking about spoilers. So some may slip out here and there in the course of this video. But this is the story about Jane Fairfax behind the scenes when she was a child growing up learning music um knowing Emma and being maybe compared to her a little bit both favorably and unfavorably and then eventually going off to live with the family of the Campbells and her situation there and it's not all a whole story of oh horrible life of being this orphan child um who lives with her poor aunt and grandmother and then gets sent off to be you know this person that has absolutely nothing going for her she does have a pretty interesting life it's just that the life of a governess is in front of her this is all she expects out of life there are parts of it that are really exciting and then there are parts that I say why did you gloss over that there was a page at which she and the family the camels went to the West Indies the West Indies that's like sorry I got I was just thinking I haven't been to the Caribbean in a very, very long time, probably the 90s. Um, and yes, and I don't usually aim to go there. No offense to the Caribbean. I'm just not much of a beach person. I go to the beach near me sometimes, etc. You know, if you know this. But the point is that if I were going to the West Indies, as they call it here, if I were going that direction, I would be taking a plane. It would be a few hours on a plane staying in accommodations of some sort, being there either for a long weekend, and I'd probably spend more than one page talking about that time. In these days, you had to take a ship. It was very dangerous. You could get sick, like Cassandra Austin's uh, fiancé, who went off to be, I think, a chaplain on a, on a ship and then dies. So it wasn't like you know it was a, it was a massive adventure and there were probably so many experiences and it's just basically glossed over so that annoyed me about the story i thought we could put a little bit of time there but but it's i know the theme of the story isn't really about that but it gets into um her childhood and sometimes jane fairfax is described almost as too good at everything which is always annoying in a book but still um, enough, enough of a true to the book experience that, um, that it became more and more interesting because you, you start to, they, they start to introduce people that you know, like Frank Churchill, for instance, and the Dixons that you hear about in Emma. And so you get that whole background of what was happening to Jane Fairfax before she moved, uh, back to, you know, her home and came across the people of Emma. So I, I really did like this book. And I would say if you, if you like Emma or any of Jane Austen's novels, this could be a good one for you. Uh, just, yeah, there was a little time jumps here and there. And, so, and, and certain people suddenly falling in love with her, for instance. It's a little, it's a little bit, um, yeah, the pace can be a little bit off, but it's still a very enjoyable, enjoyable book. And I almost liked it. No, I'm not going to say I liked it more than Emma. But in some ways, I thought it was... It was pretty well done anyway. Um, and then, of course, I read Godmersham Park by Jill Hornby, who wrote Miss Austen, and which apparently is being uh, made into an adaptation by, I think, Masterpiece, um, I think, which is good because they usually know how to do a decent adaptation. Even their bad ones are usually pretty good, if that makes sense. So that could be good. Uh, this isn't really like a sequel or a continuation of it, but it's in the same vein. It takes people in Jane Austen's life, including Jane Austen herself, and putting a story. So kind of like historical fiction, kind of like biographical fiction. This is about Anne Sharp, who was a governess to Fanny 
night. Now this was one of the things, and it's a very mild point, but um, the entire book they call the Knight family the Austins, which they were, I mean, in a way. Edward, Jane Austen's older brother, um, was born Edward Austen. He, um, he was kind of adopted by the Knight family who didn't have children of their own. And this was a thing that was done a lot in those days. This wasn't some like weird thing. And which doesn't mean that he was separated from his family in terms of you can't keep in touch with them. It's just that he was brought up as, you know, at, after a certain age as the one who would, and this happens in Emma, actually, Frank Churchill, who will inherit their fortune, which was a pretty vast one. So he is the moneyed brother in the family, and which is actually good in the long run. That was actually good for Jane Austen, but that's not really what is covered here. Um, the point is that I'm pretty sure that he had to change his name to Knight, and I, I think that his niece, I mean, his daughter, which is Jane Austen's niece, Fanny, I think she was known as Fanny Austen Knight. So they might have been known as Austen Knight. But in this book, Knight is barely even in there. And I was I was wondering about that. But it's maybe that's just me being nitpicky about things. But anyway, Anne Sharp is the governess of Fanny, the Jane Austen's niece, who um, lives at, at this point at Godmersham Park, which is a very nice uh, estate. And um, Anne Sharp we know some things about her through records and through Jane Austen's letters and other and other sources in reality but there's a lot of gaps in our knowledge about her life so uh, Jill Hornby fills in the gaps by putting into her story um, explanations about why she was a governess in the first place what 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 happened to her that she had to become a governess and um, I mean it's a different story than uh, Jane Fairfax but it does I find it so fascinating, the whole deal with being a governess in those days, um, and even, even into the Victorian times, uh, the Brontes were about this a lot, but this was such a weird place to be. You were not quite in the servant class, because the servants just didn't usually spend time with the governess as much, but you weren't one of the family, so you were in this limbo situation. And you had to be a good example. You had to be a good teacher. In this case, there there's a fine line where she where she knows she has to be a good teacher to Fanny, but she also can't be too intellectual because nobody wants a blue stocking. So there's a whole balance here. She knows she doesn't want to bring attention to any men in front of the family because that could be dangerous to her job. So things become a little difficult when Edward's brother Henry starts visiting. Henry Austin is pretty well known in Jane Austen fame because he was very material in getting Jane Austen's novels published. And, and he's fascinating because he married his cousin Eliza who also has a really interesting story. Um, French Revolution stuff, um, a, a kind of mysterious background in India um, with her mother. Um, very interesting. But in this case, her his wife, they're married already and she doesn't really show much in this, in this story. Um, so he's on his own, but he's very charming. And so that could be a bit of a challenge for many women, but especially for someone like a governess who wants to keep her job. And, and, her, and Anne Sharp in this story is trying to also figure out what happened because there's certain things that happened in her family after her mother died with her father and everything. So it's a little bit of a investigation involved that she's not sure she wants to know everything about, but once she does, it brings up a whole bunch of other dramatic moments. And there is, uh, which we know actually happened. There are some stagings of little theatrical performances at Gondershem Park, which reminds me a little bit of a slightly nicer version of what happened at Mansfield Park um, and, and what we know happened in Jane Austen's childhood. So that's pretty cool. And of course, eventually Jane Austen herself shows up with her sister Cassandra and her mother. Her mother's a little bit, um, I think, better portrayed than I often hear of her. She is often kind of like a combination of some kind of hypochondriac, uh, um, you know, well, Mrs. Bennett was kind of a hypochondriac, but you know, a lot of people like to, like to think that that's where she got, Jane Austen got the inspiration for her mother, you know, the Bennets and whatever. 
I don't know. I think she was her own person. There were some things about her that I know about that I'm not crazy about, but I also think she also went through a lot at this point. Um, this was uh, around the time when Jane's father dies and that led to a lot of major changes. But then Jane befriends Anne Sharp and this is, this is an actual truthful thing that they became friends and um, were in touch with each other for the d duration of Jane's life because and lived past Jane's life. Jane lived only till her early 40s. But anyway, um, so I, I did really enjoy this story and I would recommend it if you like that kind of thing, and I do. So just always a wonderful uh, study of what it was like to be a woman in those days, especially an unmarried woman with very few prospects. And I also finished um, a graphic a graphic novel, I guess. Um, Jane Austen, Her Heart Did Whisper, which I got from the library, which is by Manuela Santoni. I'm trying to see if she also did the, if she wrote it. And anyway, this gets into Jane Austen's uh, early years when she was um, getting into reading a lot. Her father gave her some opportunities to learn because she wasn't maybe your typical uh, girl. You know, she was a little bit different. And how she also got into writing, which is all true. And then it got into her relationship with uh, Tom Lefroy, which is, we know, we know it happened. It was, um, he was a relative of one of her friends. Um, and he, and she definitely had some kind of at least flirtation going on. So that's really what the story is. And they want to make it like his encounter with her was a bit of an inspiration for Pride and Prejudice and thereafter, which I don't know, maybe, but I already saw this story when I saw, when I read, um, I saw Becoming Jane back in, I don't know what year that was, 2006, 2007. And so, um, it felt too similar in a way, even if it is based on something that, you know, happened in, in some ways, I, I felt, it felt a little bit like deja vu. And I didn't hate it, but I didn't, I wasn't like, oh my goodness, this is such a great graphic novel of Jane Austen's life. It was just, it was okay. If you like graphic novels and you like Jane Austen, you might like this as well. But I'm glad I took it out of the library. Anyway, um, and I've been watching some adaptations. I watched uh, the 95 Pride and Prejudice again. I watched the 2000 and I think eight. That was, I can remember it was 2007, 2008, but it's around that time that there was a lot of Jane Austen adaptations coming out again. And I watched that Sense and Sensibility, which I really enjoyed. Um, I always do, even though I like the 91, 95 version so much, the 2008, I'm just going to say, is, is, I think, closer to the actual book. And that's good, too. And it's just a great story. I do love Sense and Sensibility so much. Um, I'm also reading A Year in Between, which is a book... It's not a physical book, so and I can't remember who the name of the author is. It sounds, I know it's a little bit like, it sounds a little bit like Catherine Moreland, but it's not. Anyway, when I finish it, I'll tell you more about it. Um, but that's about um, Sense Sensibility, the year at the ending where certain things happen. So I was also feeling a little bit in the mood for uh, Sense Sensibility recently. I, I thought about rereading it, and who knows if I will this month. I probably won't have a chance. I am now starting, uh, I started Persuasion again, because I must. Um, what was I going to say? I'm also, wait, while, I'm, while I'm here, I have a couple of books that I'm in um, before I get into the last adaptation. And oh, this little book holder that I have has gotten scratched up in my cats. I started What Kitty Did Next by Carrie Kavleen, which is about Kitty Bennett, Catherine Bennett, and what probably could have happened to her as is very briefly discussed in Pride and Prejudice but what happens to her directly after the story and I I like it already I've always said that I'm sure she would do better for herself under the influence of her older sisters rather than Lydia sometimes you need to be separated from certain people certain people you spend time with lead to bad habits um, and I'm making progress in the real Jane Austen, A Life in Small Things by Paula Byrne. Another one I'm taking 
slowly and enjoying very much. It's it's not a strict biography of Jane Austen, but it is it is the story of her life using different objects like um, some kind of Indian shawl was one and um, the subscription list, which I found really interesting. I'm in the theatrical scenes right now, which is a favorite part of me, of my interest in that time period, the theater, of course. It just gets into little objects or slightly bigger objects and delves into Jane Austen's life or her writing how it influenced her writing, how it influenced her life, education, relationships, whatever. Really nice. And um, I took the cover off of this one. So uh, it's actually green in real life. But um, I try with these, you know, loose, loose dust covers. I try not to read with them on because they become so flappy. Um, Celebrating Pride and Prejudice. Uh, 200 Years of Jane Austen's Masterpiece by Susanna Fullerton. It's exactly what it says on the cover and I'm enjoying that as well now that I've finished reading Pride and Prejudice again and so these are all really enjoyable reads right now I have other books that I suddenly took out of the library because I lost my capability of self-control apparently and I have other books I want to read ah uh, I don't know if I'm going to finish them all I'm kind of thinking maybe I'll carry on a little bit in August too but I'll just mix August in with a whole bunch of other things too and I watched persuasion on Netflix and I don't want to just go on and on about all the negative things about it there are some positive things some of the casting was really good um and it looks pretty and which is good I'm glad they made it look pretty it might be something that is a fun thing to have on in the background if you want to see some pretty um Jane Austen-ish dresses and uh some beautiful scenic backgrounds. Of course, that's fantastic, but we already have that in plenty of other movies and TV adaptations and stuff. So, sorry. And so, uh, it wasn't necessary. I, I don't really have a problem with the casting, even of Anne Elliot, because it's not like she doesn't look at all like how you can imagine Anne Elliot to look. Maybe the hair is different. Of course, it's that they make her not Anne Elliot. It, this is just the truth of it. There are other things that they change, but I'm like, well, you can change things because it's an adaptation. It doesn't have to be exactly faithful. Everybody changes something. Um, I always think of the, um, what was it, the 1940s Pride and Prejudice? What they change about um, Lady Catherine de Bourgh's encounter with Elizabeth Bennet. What happens directly afterwards is like... Okay, that didn't happen, but okay. Um, so yes, it's okay. It's it's all right to be creative, and occasionally it's all right to throw in an anachronism. There are times that you will watch. I mean, I, I talk about Downton Abbey all the time. How much I enjoyed Downton Abbey. There are expressions that are used there that really weren't used in the early twentieth century, and you just let it go unless you are a very very exacting historian. You just let it go. But this time, it's not just the expressions. It's that Anne Elliot isn't Anne Elliot. She may have some of the same experiences as Anne Elliot, and they say nice things about her, but it's all, you know, tell, don't show. She says things that are absolutely ridiculous. I don't want to give away a bunch of spoilers. I'm going to say one thing that she does that, to me, is enough as far as why I was like, what? So she's sitting, um, you know, she's visiting, and I'm trying to remember the name of the place, um, and it's not coming to me. Anyway, she is with the um, Musgrove family, who are her her sister's husband's family, and they are, I, I like the Musgroves. I've always had no problem with them. Um, some of them are a little silly, but they, but they're in general one of the nicer families, really. And even though I know this in the book, it's true. For some reason, Anne decides to tell everybody at the table, oh, you know what? Um, actually, uh, Musgrove, Charles, I think his first name, names are just falling out of my head because my brain just rotted from watching this. Anyway, she's like, okay, you know, he actually asked me to marry him first, but I turned him down. And then he went for my sister in front of all of them. I mean, it's different if you hear about that and gossip. But to say that in front of everybody and just bleh, just say that 
Anne Elliot would never. Anne Elliot would never. So that was it. That When I saw that, I was like, okay, I'll watch the rest of the movie because I want to see how it's done. But... Uh, uh, anyway, so that was just rough for me. Um, I don't want to say I hated it because that's just being too absolute about things. I understand that some people can enjoy it, especially if they haven't read Persuasion. But I, I just want, whoever wrote it, I just want to say why. Why did you make these choices? You didn't have to. She is an amazing character on her own. She is not Elizabeth Bennet. She is not Bridget Jones. She is not um, any of these other characters. She is not, yes, yeah, she's not Marianne Dashwood. All wonderful people, but they make her all of these kind of impulsive, much more um, speak your mind kind of people. And she wasn't like that. Not that she never said anything, but she was a lot more subtle. Anyway, I don't really want to talk about it anymore because I, I, you know, my blood pressure is lower than it was before. And I'm glad about that. And I want to keep it that way. So on that note, I have a little more of July to look forward to. I have a lovely heat wave to look forward to. So... So on that note, we will look forward to hopefully some wonderful air-conditioned moments in July. And this is Catherine, taking tea with Catherine. Have a lovely tea and bookville day.